One more acknowledgement for this extraordinary choir. Dr. Butts, as I begin, I would want you to know I am once again both humbled and proud to speak from your pulpit before your beloved Abyssinian Baptist Church community. Words could never capture my gratitude to you or to your leadership, including Chairman of the Board of Deacons, Gerald Barbour, and my classmate, church clerk, Sheila Boston Robinson. <laughs> and certainly no words could capture my thanks to your membership. My congregation and I are deeply honored at your invitation and their welcome. To your choir, an echo of heaven on earth, my thanks. And to Abyssinians Naomi Graham and Emmanuel's Mark Heitlinger, the glue that holds our operation together. And finally, to those here from Temple Emmanuel, my profound appreciation for your presence. As I've said before, a rabbi cannot lead where his people will not follow. Thank you for recognizing. <laughs> thank you for recognizing the importance of this partnership to me and to us all. Now I'm going to begin with a very sad story, one you know. Once upon a time, there were two brothers. Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be rewarded? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you can rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out to the field. While they were there in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I do not know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Two weeks ago, I returned from a congregational pilgrimage to Israel. There we visited Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center, recounting the systematic slaughter of six million Jews and five million gypsies, Jehovah's Witnesses, people with disabilities, gays, and blacks in Nazi-occupied Europe. Prominent in the memorial stands a tribute to the righteous among the nations, non-Jews who risked their lives to save Jews from Hitler's final solution. One was Imre Bathory, a Hungarian farmer who encountered a young Jewish man, Martin Wiesel, on a train attempting to evade deportation to the concentration camps. I know that you are a Jew in trouble, Bathory reassured Wiesel. I'll help you. 
He then feigned to government officials that Wiesel was his son and sheltered him and four other Jews in his farmhouse. When interviewed about his heroism, Bathory remarked pointedly, I know that when I stand before God on Judgment Day, I shall not be asked the question posed to Cain, where were you when your brother's blood was crying out to God? By design, Bathory's warning looms over the exhibit. When I read it, I shuddered. Every day God demands of us what God demanded of Cain. Where are you? Can't you hear that your brother's blood cries out to me? We live in an age of callous disregard for human dignity. An era of open hatred that boldly demonizes anyone different and of stealth discrimination that deftly thumbs the scales of fairness, keeping the disadvantaged down and perpetuating old suspicions. Open hatred. On Saturday morning, October 27th, in Pittsburgh, just as my congregation was gathering for Sabbath services in New York, a white nationalist entered a synagogue with an assault rifle and multiple handguns, shouted, all Jews must die, and shot dead 11 worshipers, one of the most horrific acts of anti-Semitic violence in our nation's history. That day, I, and I'm sure you, tasted the bitter memory of the massacre at the Emanuel AME Church in Charleston three years ago. As I told you Friday in Temple, the first call I received that afternoon was from Dr. Butts. We've got to do something, Joshua, he said. We've got to do something. The Pittsburgh shooting proved once again the desperate need for meaningful gun safety legislation. Had Robert Bowers walked into Tree of Life or Dylan Roof into Mother Emanuel with a knife instead of a gun, the outcome surely would have been different. And it proved once again that bigots are equal opportunity haters. Bowers' loathsome rhetoric targeted Muslims and refugees too. We've got to do something. Together we must affect a sea change, reverse the tides of intolerance long surging in America, but stirred anew by a politics of hate that would drown all minorities, no matter our religion, ethnicity, race, or gender identity or preference. As people of faith, we must offer a wholly different view of what America ought to be. And if we're looking for a place to begin, I suggest we start with the immigration crisis unfolding on our borders. Now, I'm not talking about the one the White House would have us believe, an invasion of drug runners and terrorists, but rather the crisis of man's inhumanity to man of family separations, of sending back into danger those fleeing for their lives. The highest biblical ideal is welcoming the stranger, no fewer than 36 times does the Torah command it. So how can we not respond to today's dehumanization of immigrants and asylum seekers, what the late Senator John McCain described in his final memoir as the exploitation by opportunists of old fears and animosities that have blighted American history. Who better than African Americans and Jews in coalition to lift our voices? Whether we came here on slave ships or immigrant ships or our ships were barred entry in the harbor, our peoples have known the obstacles to making it in America. 
Let me tell you about Bernard Marx. Marx was a survivor of both the Auschwitz and the Dachau concentration camps. On December 28th, he died. But not before making headlines comparing the Trump administration's policy on refugees to America's quotas that turned away Jews fleeing Hitler. I feel compelled to raise my voice when I hear echoes of my childhood, he wrote. The fear that immigrants in the United States live with is personal and familiar to me. I cannot forget the day the special police came to the door of our home in Poland and took my father away. One of the most eloquent spokesmen for immigrant justice has been Temple Emanuel's own Robert Morgenthau. If we cannot be our brother's brother, if we cannot be our brother's keeper, he admonishes us, let us at least be our brother's brother. But there's another type of bigotry we've got to contend with. Less threatening to life and limb than the militant white nationalism of Robert Bowers and less overt than the anti-immigrant nativism of Donald Trump but much more prevalent. It's a prejudice that long predated our current president. I'm referring to a politics of passivity toward a status quo that prioritizes personal advantage over the greater good. And to the biased conclusions we often draw about one another without attempting to know one another where the African-American and Jewish communities are concerned, this veiled discrimination, sometimes it's a thinly veiled discrimination, manifests in the old racism deeply embedded in America's social structures and the new anti-Semitism cleverly cloaked in the language of social justice. First, the old racism. 2019 marks the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the first African slaves in Jamestown. And slavery's effects still linger. De facto segregation still exists. Voter suppression continues. From coast to coast, even in America's more heterogeneous neighborhoods, racial profiling persists. According to a recent national survey, Four in ten African Americans encounter racial bias in stores and restaurants, and five in ten face it in the workplace. When Starbucks has to close all its coffee shops for racial bias training, you know America's got a problem. Earlier this month, Reniqua Allen, author of the newly released It Was All a Dream, a new generation confronts the broken promise to black America, chronicled her meetings with African-American millennials across the nation. All spoke of the limited opportunity that belies the common perceptions of equality. The American dream, the idea that anyone can succeed through hard work is one of the most enduring myths in this country and one of its most prominent falsehoods, she wrote. Today, young black Americans are not being chased down by dogs. We don't have to fight to use the same restrooms and water fountains as people who don't look like us. But we're still tired of having to prove our humanity and trying to make sure that America makes good on its promise. The percentage of blacks represented among the poor remains twice that of whites. The chasm dividing blacks and whites in policing health care, job opportunities, median wealth, and home ownership remains a moral catastrophe. Now, some Americans are happy to keep it that way, which is why bigots like Steve King, who hear no offense in the term white supremacist, can hang around so long. Many more, though, decry the inequity, but have chosen to accept the Faustian bargain of economic policies 
that effectively prioritize individual wealth over communal well-being. They happily ride each economic crest high above those swamped in the troughs below. In his recent column, The Remoralization of the Market, David Brooks cited, of all people, Tucker Carlson. American elites are using ruthless market forces to enrich themselves and immiserate everyone else, he paraphrased the Fox commentator. The crucial question, Brooks concluded, is not how can we have a good economy, it's how can we have a good society. The old institutionalized racism endures. Now, what do I mean by the new anti-Semitism? I'm referring to the growing phenomenon of anti-Zionist intersectionality that obliterates the boundary between Israel and all Jews. It occurs in myriad settings, but especially today in our institutions of higher learning. On many college campuses and academic assemblies, Israel is portrayed as the sole cause of Palestinian suffering with insufficient regard to history or the role of other Arab states. Jewish students and non-Jewish students too who seek to study in Israel or in any way associate with Israel are increasingly tarred as supporters of an oppressive regime. Universities present themselves as constrained by the principle of academic freedom, unable to rein in student bullying and faculty hostility. As early as high school, children are subject to it. But the new anti-Semitism isn't limited to the academy. Even the Democratic Party's fringes have trafficked in it. Two weeks ago, Recently elected Representative Rashida Tlaib accused four Senate sponsors of a bill protecting Israel from boycotts of, quote, forgetting what country they represent. Marco Rubio quickly reminded her that the dual loyalty canard, the accusation that Jews can't be faithful Americans, is one of the anti-Semites' favorite tropes. Now, I want to be clear. I, in fact, am uncomfortable with this bill because I believe it runs afoul of the First Amendment. And with those who argue Israel's government must renew its efforts toward a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I heartily agree. But when academicians or politicians or the UN's moralizers hold Israel to standards different than countries notorious for their human rights abuses, when activist groups exclude Jews from participation in social justice causes because of their presumed association with Israel, when leaders of the National Women's March need to be convinced to distance themselves from the anti-Semitism of Louis Farrakhan, when historical revisionists portray the Holocaust as just one of many genocides, their anti-Semitism reveals itself. And in the wake of Pittsburgh and too many other assaults on the Jewish community, anti-Semitism must not be tolerated as an evil necessary for the advancement of any other good. Who needs it? Who needs it? Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Against the old systemic racism and this new anti-Semitism, we need to lift our voices. Jews in America need to recognize that the ladder of upward mobility many of us were able to climb successfully generations ago has seen its rungs all but collapse. The percentage of African Americans represented among the poor in this country is far greater than it has ever been for Jews. Jewish outrage, while vocal in some quarters, has been largely missing in action. We must do better. And when anti-Zionists challenge the necessity of a Jewish homeland 
as a living symbol of Jewish survival and a secure refuge against anti-Semitism sweeping again across Europe, we can answer as Dr. King did when he called anti-Zionism the denial to the Jewish people of a fundamental right we justly claim and freely accord to all other nations of the globe. The ultimate measure of a human being, Dr. King once maintained, is not where one stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where one stands at times of challenge and controversy. That's why Dr. King went to jail in 1963. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham, he insisted. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. We can never forget that everything Hitler did in Germany was legal and everything the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was illegal. It was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. But I am sure that if I had lived in Germany during that time, King writes, I would have aided and comforted my Jewish brothers. If I lived in a country today where certain principles dear to our faith were suppressed, I believe I would openly advocate disobeying those anti-religious laws. We are living in a country today where certain principles dear to our faiths, core to our very identities, are being suppressed openly and artfully. They are sacrificed daily on the altars of nativism and greed, fear and deception. We've got to do something. As I stood quietly in Yad Vashem, and read the Hungarian rescuer Imre Bathory's words, I thought of Dr. King, and I thought of Dr. Butts, and I thought of the Talmudic teaching that in the hour of final judgment, God's messengers will ask each of us, what did you do with your life? To those who say, I fed the hungry, they will reply, this is God's gate, enter. To those who reply, I gave water to the thirsty, they will respond, this is God's gate, enter. To those who respond, I clothed the naked, they will answer, this is God's gate, enter. To those who answer, the fear of the Lord was my treasure, they will promise, this is God's gate, enter. At the dawn of this new year, 2019, may the fear of the Lord be our treasure. And on this weekend, which celebrates the enduring legacy of God's faithful messenger, May we begin to direct our brief stay on earth so that when we stand before God and the question is put to us, what did you do with your life? We too will be welcomed into God's presence. Amen.